Now joining me now from New York is Raju Narisetti. He's a professor of journalism at Columbia University. And we've also got Sood Haider with us in the studio. He's the head of data and insight here at TRT World. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Raju, let me begin with you. Facebook inflating those numbers, especially on video views. Was it deliberate and nefarious or was it a mistake with the algorithm? I think the courts are going to decide that because of the lawsuit that's been filed against them. Clearly, there was a mistake, and it looks like they discovered the mistake. The lawsuit is really saying that even after they discovered it, they really took a long time to fix it because mm -hmm. they were very worried about signaling that they had really bad numbers. So I think it's going to be a matter of the court deciding whether it was deliberate or whether it was accidental. So, so those who take it a step further and say whether it was deliberate or accidental, they are responsible for media organizations recalibrating, laying off people, switching to video. Should Facebook be held responsible for what media companies did in response to the numbers? Um, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, the media companies are responsible think... for their own uh, oh, uh, for their own operations and mm -hmm. how they monitor and how they commercialize. I think uh, putting the blame onto Facebook uh, is is a bit of an overreaction. So Facebook may have contributed to misreporting that may right. have led to certain decisions being made, but ultimately the decision as to how to operate a newsroom and how to uh, uh, allocate resources per se is the responsibility of the media owners and right. managers. Right. So, Raju, was that naivety from the media organizations, and it's a whole bunch of media organizations, or were they just, you know, dumb and, and didn't they didn't look at the data properly and weren't cautious enough, or should be... Should Facebook be held responsible in some way? So it's important to remember that the lawsuit has been brought by advertisers and not publishers. I think the question is, did Facebook say the right things and did they give the right incentives for a lot of publishers to do what was called pivoting to video? And I think that's the real question here to address. The reality is that there is about 37, 38% of global advertising, which is close to $200 billion every year, is still in television and is looking to move more and more towards digital. So there is a business reason for Facebook, as well as publishers, to want to do more video. The question is, did publishers get fooled by the scale of Facebook and mm -hmm. the desire of Facebook to do a lot more video and jump right in? And obviously, if the numbers are bad, then you think that you're doing well while you're not. But I agree. I don't think that publishers can blame Facebook for decisions that publishers made. But you could argue that the incentives uh, and the data was false, and that led to a feeling that maybe video on Facebook will be a lot more lucrative than it turned mm -hmm. out to be. Yeah, Raju, according to the best available information, Facebook knew about this in 2015. They knew there was a problem with the algorithm, right? As you said, we don't know whether this is deliberate or whether it was just a mistake. But then when we have quotes from Mark Zuckerberg in 2016, where he's championing video and he's saying, we're entering this new golden age of video. I wouldn't be surprised if you fast forward five years and most of the content that people see on Facebook and are sharing on a day-to-day -day basis is video. When Facebook was still bullish about video and video first, whether for advertisers or for media content producers, do you believe that there's an element of responsibility that Zuckerberg was, was, was still telling people this is the future while he knew there was a fundamental problem? I don't think we know how much uh, Mr. Zuckerberg knew or not. But philosophically, what they're saying is still valid, right? Which is that, again, there's a lot more demand for video. There's a lot more advertising dollars behind video. And that's the reason to want to do more video to compete better against YouTube. Whether they spun this into something a lot larger than it really was, I think that is the real question. The lawsuit, if you look at it carefully, makes a very damning allegations mm -hmm. that Facebook slow walked the problem back, meaning that they took their time to fix it because they didn't want a big drop in video views to be signaled to the world. And so there is serious questions about what they knew and whether they deliberately didn't fix it. So I think that will come out, assuming this court this case goes to trial, often these kind of cases tend to get settled for some money with no admission of guilt, and that'll be the end of that. So it'll be interesting to see if this becomes an actual precedent-setting case that goes right. to trial and there is a guilty verdict. Yeah, I just want to park off the lawsuit for, for a second and sort of separate 
the, the marketing and advertising element here and mm -hmm. talk about media content producers, specifically news producers. Um, so a bit of introspection for us. We were both yeah. at AJ Plus at the yeah. same time, uh, circa 2013, yeah. setting it up, 2014, 2015, right? Now I remember, so, and you were, you were more involved behind the scenes with the numbers, mm -hmm. and I was helping produce the content. And we re remember that when we started posting things to Facebook in 2014, we were getting massive views for things, huge numbers. Uh, a video would go out. It wasn't unusual for something to get 300, 400,000 views overnight. And then there was a time where it sort of like fell off a cliff in 2015, where suddenly something that was getting 300,000 views is only getting 50,000 views or so, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have these conversations with you because we were in different departments. Mm -hmm. But did you notice that something was wrong? Or did you feel like something weird has changed here with the algorithm? So, I mean, you do notice about Facebook and every few so or so months, Facebook would change the newsfeed algorithm for whatever reasons, uh, whether it's to improve the product, whether it's uh, they're getting pressure from to, uh, you know, drown out fake news. Uh, they do continuously make changes uh, to the newsfeed algorithm. It's not fixed. And the way the newsfeed algorithm is designed, it's designed to be very dynamic. So. Mm -hmm you do see these shifts every now and then, and that's pretty much normal in terms of how Facebook operates. It's deliberate by design. These fluctuations are deliberate by design of Facebook. Did we know that the view counts were getting a steroid injection? And, and then taking that a step further, did we make decisions in terms of hiring, firing, mm. editorial and otherwise, based on that? Because there was a push to go Facebook first, first. and to mm -hmm. make things more Facebook friendly mm -hmm. because Facebook was doing so well. I mean, uh, based on absolutely the numbers, no, but uh, dedicating more resources maybe towards mm -hmm. uh, Facebook because uh, it seems that the product seems to be getting more traction than other platforms, possibly yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in terms of you know, uh, hiring or firing, absolutely no. And the reason being is it was a growing platform. Uh, at that point in time, AJ Plus was a first, one of the first movers uh, onto the Facebook uh, platform, specifically for the news uh, segment on, mm -hmm. on video. And in digital, the first mover advantage um, gets you a little bit of more runway, or a lot more runway than competition. So there are lots of factors to consider in, mm -hmm. in that scenario in particular. Yeah, so Raju, when you, talk to your students and they, they would ask, and maybe I, I'm, I'm just asking you as a teacher here, what's the lesson for media organizations? Because we have Vice, Mike, Vox, Mashable, all of them complaining that Facebook kind of misled them, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking a little bit about AJ Plus in those days when the views were much higher and that might have influenced policy making within an organization. I remember Mark Twain saying something like, I would never read a health magazine because I might die of a misprint, right? It, did media organizations show too much trust in Facebook and the numbers? Absolutely, and we've been doing this for several years. I don't know if you remember a company called Upworthy, mm. which became this huge phenomenon of viral stories, positive stories on Facebook, and overnight it disappeared because Facebook changed its algorithm to kind of downplay those kind of stories. I think part of the problem has been a lot of the funding that has come to media companies in the last few years has come from private equity and venture capital, and there, success is defined as growth, and growth is defined as page views, video views, unique visits. And the easiest way some of these companies found out that they can goose those numbers was to be on Facebook. To AJ Plus's credit, they really invented or reinvented the social video journalism, right? So I think there was some positive that came out of it. But a lot of the other companies that went in that actually decided that we will go all in into video made strategic choices that turned out to be big mistakes. I think the fundamental failure in the last few years has been to forget the fact that Facebook works for Facebook, mm -hmm. that it, the right platform doesn't necessarily work for our business models. And I think that's been the failure. I don't think it's a problem of wanting journalists to do more multimedia video. I think readers want to see pictures, readers want to view video, readers want to listen to audio, all of that, and we can provide all of that in digital. The problem is when we think that a platform that has two billion people is somehow going to also help with our business model. All it can do is to help with 
as a marketing vehicle, but nothing more than that. Yeah, and, and one interesting point here, it's separate, but I, I feel in terms of housekeeping, it's worth making mm -hmm. this point. We try to get former Facebook employees willing to either criticize or defend the company. All of them said because of fears of litigation, <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to even discuss this. And what's interesting is that we've we've got Saudi we've got Saudis willing to discuss the Khashoggi <laughs> case and all sorts of things yes. on this program, but nobody but willing to discuss Facebook, Facebook on this program. So you know, <laughs> chew on that if you will. What does that say about the power of this kind of Leviathan as a media organization, Saud? Is the lesson that you shouldn't take a kind of uh, windsock approach and just sort of allow yourself to get sucked into the trend of where the views are? You need to even question those big numbers when you see them? Uh, for sure, especially if you're in the news business and uh, you, know, you should use the same principles of fact checking uh, when you're getting data out of uh, uh, these other platforms. So yes, Facebook is big and it's probably one of the biggest internet properties that uh, are, is the end world, and they own multiple other properties, including Instagram, WhatsApp. So it's it's a big, it's a beast, uh, and um, uh, and a lot of the internet activists, at least a lot of the open internet activists, had raised this flag early on, five years ago, mm. when Facebook was starting to you know so, show signs that it's it's in it for the long game saying that you know, it, uh, Facebook, certain elements of Facebook go against the principles of the open internet, where Facebook is trying to create a sub-internet by itself within the Facebook platform. Uh, and the principles of the open internet is for this information and content to be outside and open for everyone. Facebook only opens up its content to Facebook users. And the reason for that is demonetizing uh, per user and demonetizing in the, in the form of ads. And for media companies and uh, media companies that are in the news business, it's critical for them now to look at to what they use Facebook for. Does mm -hmm. it advance their cause? I mean, there are certain parts of this world that you can reach on Facebook or you can't reach on Facebook. So it, it all depends on the audience and on the product that is, uh, is being uh, produced. And critical decisions have to be made as to what to put on Facebook and what not to put on Facebook. Right. Raju. Uh, broadening it out beyond Facebook, let's just include its sister company, Instagram, let's include Twitter, let's include YouTube. Given all we know about how uh, advertisers can help augment something, whether it comes from a news company or, or any, anyone else, you can pay for promoted content. These, these companies have their own algorithms for pushing stuff to the top and so on. For those people who go onto social media and think that that thing that appears first or that thing that is the most, that, that thing that's the, the ripe apple for me to, to pick has come in front of me organically. Are they stupid or what is it? What should they be aware of? I don't think readers are ever stupid, right? If you look at a newspaper, the five stories or six stories on the front page don't come organically, right? They're selected by a group of individuals the day before. I think the difference is obviously the algorithm is based on what people are clicking and their, their network and their social network. So that, I think clearly there is an understanding that this is not something that is organic. I think the challenge is people forget that software and business decisions are really intertwined and what is pushed in front of you often has a business reason, it is not just altruistic. And the challenge we are facing on these social platforms is people are unable to distinguish between what is right or wrong or what is good quality and what is not. And these platforms are now saying we are so big that we can't do it either. And I think that's the fundamental challenge we have. In the US, for example, we are finding that a lot of older people are more susceptible to spreading viral fake news than younger right. people. So clearly there are those kind of li media literacy challenges as well. So that's the real issue I think here. Yeah, we all have that uncle on WhatsApp <laughs> who sends us all those forwarded <laughs> videos that are complete <laughs> rumors. So are we getting better at this? Um, uh, all things considered, so are we getting better at figuring this out? I'd say sadly, uh, no. And uh, I come from a technology background and I see have seen technology advance pretty much over my lifetime. Uh, the rate of change of technology is much faster than what human systems or policies uh, uh, are being changed to adapt to those changes. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not, it's not a, 
it's not a one-sided uh, decision. Or, you know, this is something that society as a whole and different stakeholders in society have to move forward, and mostly driven by policymaking because policymakers are the ones who can at least once you have it in policy, once you have it as policy, then it goes into law. That law can be enforced, but without having you know those frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, where you know you can call big institutions and organizations into account, then it becomes uh, in a in a market economy win takes it all. Right, and this is what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of <laughs> ominous, but you know I I think having these conversations is probably a good example of trying to grapple with it, right? And yeah. this lawsuit and Facebook's pushback, this is fascinating, interesting times that we live in. Sud Haider and Raju Narisetti, I've got to move on, but I thank you both for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Thank you.